in those in those discussions, what was being said was the uh, Egyptian army needs another year and a half to two years in order to be prepared for war. Therefore, let's attack. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to the struggle. The struggle is shown on 22 cable stations from Vermont to New York City on the internet at thestruggle.org. Our YouTube channel, Struggle Video Media. Connecticut saw the first cut showing of a film about a group of people running the length of the West Bank in Palestine and planting olive trees at their various stops. It's called Run Across Palestine and will show a talk by the coordinating producer of the film, Vivian Sansour, and the entire movie's trailer. Then more of a New York City talk by Miko Pellet about his book, The General's Son which refutes many of the beloved myths of Zionism. We begin in Hartford, Connecticut with Vivian Sansour of Beit Jala, Palestine, who talks about the film which tries to highlight the loss of 500,000 olive trees to the wall and to Israeli settlers. This is a film that was uh, produced um, uh, by um, Aaron Dennis and uh, Jakob Wheeler, and I was the coordinating producer there. Uh, it was produced uh, th uh, through, with the cooperation with um, On the Ground, which is a nonprofit organization based in northern Michigan. And uh, what we did, which I don't want to tell you much because you'll see it in the film, but we basically uh, did something called the Run Across Palestine, where we ran um, a, a marathon, a total of 129 miles. Uh, I did not run. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, I was the runs coordinator. But we ran from the south of uh, the West Bank to the very north. Uh, and the idea was wherever we stopped, we wanted to raise awareness about the struggle of the farmers uh, in Palestine. And uh, so what we did is every night we would stay up all night, really Aaron, the editor, would do that. And we would have a film in the morning, like a short video of two minutes, three minutes, so that people who sponsored the runners, um, the idea was wherever we ran, we also, the, the um, people who sponsored the runners, they basically sponsored the planting of olive trees. Uh, and so we wanted people in the U.S. here to see what we were doing every day. And so we did these short videos every day of what, what we did. Uh, and from that, we thought, well, we filmed so much, we should definitely, you know, do a full documentary. So we did. And uh, tonight, really, uh, we just finished it. So what you're going to look at tonight is, again, you are the very first audience. And uh, the film has not been premiered yet. It will be hopefully in September in Traverse City, Michigan. And uh, we just got word that we got accepted in the Boston Palestine Film Festival. So if you want to go to Boston in October. Um, uh, so since Boston's so close, you can go and see it there. But uh, anyway, I don't want to tell you more about the film because you're going to see it, but uh, I hope you enjoy it, and uh, we will have time to talk about it afterwards, and I'll be open for uh, discussion. So enjoy. <laughs> Wherever they uproot an olive tree, we're going to plant a tree. And that is a huge message of hope and serious perseverance. We're going to do a run. It'll be a run across Palestine, roughly from Hebron to Janine. And we're going to run together. We're going to have an experience together. We're going to bring lots of attention to the struggles of these farmers and plant thousands of trees along the way. We might encounter some barriers, but that's just what we're here for, to break down barriers. We've broken down so many barriers by being here in the first place.
When you plant a tree, you're also planting a vision for the future. You're saying, I have a future. The question is uh, that we planted many olive trees over there and uh, how are they going to survive? Um, one of the things uh, that uh, we've been, you know, one of the mantras that we have been carrying is that we are insisting on life and that means that wherever they uproot a tree we're going to plant a tree and that also means that at times and it has happened, uh, if you saw the very first uh, 500 trees we uprooted, uh, many of them, uh, sorry, we planted, <laughs> many of them have been uprooted since then. The settlers attacked the village actually not even a month after we planted them, and they have uprooted them. Uh, but this is why um, we will continue to raise funds to plant more trees. Um, you know, uh, the farmers do take care of their um, trees. Uh, actually, in Palestine, one of the, the, the most beautiful terms that we use um, in agricultural terms, we say, uh, we serve the tree. Uh, farmers don't say, I am tending to my tree. They say, I serve my tree. So if you ask a farmer, for example, how do you think the yield will be this year? They will answer you, it depends on my service. And this is really a beautiful and ancient um, uh, part of our culture, which is very much based in agriculture, which understands on a practical level, uh, on an experiential level, the importance of reciprocity in life. Because as we know, agriculture is a metaphor for life. And um, it is life. And uh, so how will they survive? Uh, people will do their best to continue to serve their trees. Uh, we will continue to do our best uh, with people like you and the, the efforts that the Palestine Fair Trade Association and others are doing in Palestine uh, to plant more trees and uh, we'll just do our part and uh, they will survive. A another thing, sorry, but the, the olive tree, for example, is a native tree. And so uh, the way we have survived uh, before the occupation and through the occupation and hopefully after, uh, I think the trees will too. Sorry, uh, the question is whether Palestinians have any way uh, to sue the Israeli, in Israeli court for their civil rights, correct? Or, or also, you were uh, Well, uh, this is a, an excellent question and it, it has a long answer, but I'll try to be brief. Uh, yeah. No, 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 but it's a very good question, actually, uh, because it's in the heart of the matter also. Um, well, first, to answer the first part of the question, uh, Nasser is an American citizen as well, and I'm an American citizen too, but uh, when, when we go back, we are not treated as American citizens. We have to, for example, I'm not allowed to go on Jewish-only roads, um, I am not allowed to use the airport in Tel Aviv. I have to go through Jordan, which is a whole day of travel for me extra. Um, so when I arrive, they take my American passport and they stamp it with my Palestinian ID number, which means that this is, the idea is the policy is once a Palestinian, always a Palestinian, like I explained. So in Nas, but it does give you some kind of cushion, although as we know, you know, Rachel Corey was bulldozed and nobody cared. Uh, but for Nasser's case, he owns a big company. Um, the State Department has been interested in the work that he's been doing. Uh, we had received oftentimes the American uh, ambassador in Canaan Fair Trade. So there was that personal relationship that allowed uh, for him to Actually, I'm the one who was outside when he was in prison making all these phone calls 
calling these people and saying, hey, you know, can you do anything? He's an American citizen. And uh, luckily, because of that connection, we were able to put some pressure. Otherwise, actually, Nasser would still be in jail. And to go back to you, the other part of your question is that um, there's something, Palestinians can be arrested without any charges. Uh, the, you, they don't, they don't, th there's no recourse, there's nothing you can do. In fact, we have this horrible thing called administrative detention, which um, Israel is, the Israeli army can come, uh, arrest you, and then uh, they don't have, they have a, what is called a secret file, which you don't know anything about, uh, your family doesn't know anything about, and they can keep you uh, three months at a time without any charge, but then the three months can constantly be renewed. So there are prisoners in Palestinian, uh, Palestinian political prisons, prisoners in Israeli jails who have been in prison for years under this administrative detention. So imagine you're in prison for all these years and you don't even know why, you know, so there is no trial. Um, this is why, I don't know if you've heard, but uh, Palestinian prisoners have been doing hunger strikes uh, and they've been on, uh, we've had a prisoner who was on hunger strike for 92 days. Uh, one of them, for example, was a, um, a, a soccer player who was on hunger strike. Uh, a woman named Hana Shalabi was on hunger strike. And these people, they are in prison and they refuse to eat because they are under administrative detention. They're saying, I will not eat until I know why I'm here. Um, so this, this, this is a very, I would encourage you to look into it about the Palestinian hunger strikers because it's an important uh, subject and these people are really amazing because really they are starving themselves for dignity. Um, this is one thing uh, and there are ways you can sue like only for example um, when land is confiscated uh, there are Israeli lawyers who are people in Israel organizations uh, interested in uh, pursuing you know, civil rights and all of that. They sue. I don't know the details of how the lawsuit happens, but for example, there's a village called Bil'in, uh, and there's another village called Budros, where um, they have been working with lawyers inside Israel, suing the courts in Israel uh, to, to basically get their land back. And it is to move the wall from taking so much of their land. I don't know the legal details, but I know that there are lawsuits that uh, exist over land. But even that, there is a question you have to ask, um, and it's a constant debate whether you know you are still working with the occupying power. It, it, the system, of course, does not serve you. It serves uh, the, the powers that control your life. Uh, this is a question about water. So, you know. uh, uh, the water situation in Palestine is uh, is really terrible, uh, and there's this idea that uh, just like the wall, they say it's for security. Uh, they say that there isn't enough water. In reality, um, there's a lot of water in Palestine, lots of aquifers. Uh, the problem is that um, Palestinians are not allowed to uh, access this water. So we do have access to some. Uh, aquifers, but we are, for example, where I lived in Jenin for two years, uh, I think, don't quote me on the numbers, but I believe that the aquifer that all of Jenin has to take water from is like 400, uh, sorry, one kilometer deep, and we're only allowed to pump 400 meters or something like that. Um, I, I don't know the numbers exactly, but basically um, the settlements that are built are all around um, all around the cities and the villages. Uh, even if there is an aquifer in the Palestinian village, they have these straws that they put under and they suck the water out. And so this is why uh, most recently, for example, I was working in doing a story in Laoja, which is uh, a farming community in, in the Jordan Valley, which has a spring in their community. And the water runs right through in, in pipes right through their village to these uh, agribusiness uh, mass farms of dates. 
and they cannot access water. So literally, uh, I wish I could show you the images, but you're in this area that people literally going thirsty, and then right next to it is an Israeli settler who has green pastures of uh, lawn and uh, green trees. And the settlement, like for example, where I live in Bethlehem, when uh, I wake up in the morning, I'm never sure if we're gonna have water to shower or not. Um, and if it weren't for really ancient practices that the farmers always had, which is we collect rainwater, I think we would be thirsty. So many farmers that I work with also say, you know, we are dying of thirst because... I mean, that's very likely because now what happens is Israel controls the water and then we have to buy, like this, fam this village I'm telling you about in Oja, the spring belongs to their community. They, it's been there for hundreds and hundreds of years, and now they can't access it. They have to buy water from Israeli companies that control the water. So it's very expensive. I mean, if... Uh, so I can totally imagine that if I'm a mother and I have to buy water or my medication, for, I'll buy water for my children. Uh, that's a good question. I, uh, oh, why the United Nations is not interfering? But then again, I mean, this is an excellent question. And also, why is the UN not interfering with? I mean, there are UN resolutions about refugee rights. There are UN resolutions about uh, all kinds of things that uh, you know the UN is not pushing for. And um, unfortunately, our government here in the United States vetoes every initiative uh, that happens in the UN that supports uh, holding Israel accountable. Since you're a Franciscan community, I should tell you, where I uh, live and where I grew up is in a small town called Bejala, which is part of the Bethlehem uh, district area. Uh, basically, you cross the street and you're in Bethlehem. <laughs> Uh, but uh, we have uh, one of the oldest Franciscan uh, monasteries, which is also a winery. We also have a, a Franciscan nunnery that uh, the nuns have a nursery as well for children. And uh, in the area where um, the, the, uh, sorry, the monastery is and the winery and where the nuns have their, um, uh, their uh, nursery, uh, this is all now set for confiscation. This is one of the main struggles that we are dealing with right now in my town. Uh, if you saw the pictures of the uprooting of the trees, uh, this is in that area. And uh, we have our local priest uh, has been conducting mass every Friday. Uh, so that he said, you know, the UN is not helping us. Uh, the other governments are not helping us maybe God will help us. So what he's doing is uh, he's calling mass every Friday on the land where the trees are um, in, in, uh, under confisca uh, are you know, being threatened to be uprooted. And basically what they're gonna do is um, disconnect the nunnery from our community, which is where our kids go to, uh, what do you call it, day, day, daycare? Um, and so, but in terms of lawsuits as well, now uh, the church is suing, uh, the, the Franciscan monks have joined the lawsuit uh, suing uh, the Israeli government for wanting to uh, annex and take their land. We don't know what's going to happen with that, but um, it's one of like, it's really aside from the human tragedy, I mean for me, I grew up in a a Catholic school, and and for us this was a place where we also walked. Uh, we we were in Girl Scouts. This is where we had our picnics. So this is part of our agricultural uh, and cultural um, places that we uh, spend time uh, there. It, we are connected to it. But uh, aside from that human part. Um, Environmentally, it's really a disaster because some of these terraces are literally hundreds and hundreds of years old. Uh, some of the people who are living there are now being threatened to be arrested in their own homes. Uh, so um, I just thought perhaps, you know, since you are Franciscan, 
<laughs> congregation, you might want to know that, and follow this story. Um, the name of the area is called Kremizan, and the priest even has, I think, um, a page on online on Facebook called Kremizan is Ours. Um, so I encourage you to look at it. But I also want to encourage you to um, follow the film. Uh, like I said, you're really the very first people who ever saw the film, so it's very important to hear your feedback. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited to see that many of you liked it. Uh, you can now like it on Facebook. It will, uh, you can go to the People and the Olive uh, Facebook page and like it there. And that would be very, and share it maybe. There's a trailer on that page there. So, um, and I hope that you can support also the work of uh, the Run Across Palestine in planting more trees. Yeah. Now to more of Miko Pellet. His grandfather signed the Israeli Declaration of Independence. His father was a top Israeli general. In video we showed in a prior program, he talked about his personal transformation. This time he talks about the 1967 war, the war in which Israel supposedly attacked first to prevent annihilation. Now, if we move forward again to, uh, or we move forward to, to uh, 1967, uh, you know, the 45th anniversary of the Six Day War was just a few days ago. Um, I talk, again, I talk, I talk about being the general son. This is probably one of the most significant aspects of the story of what I relay in the, in the book and probably one of the, one of the stories that raises uh, the, the most uh, controversy or the, mo the most arguments. And once again, the story goes along with the, with the narrative. What is the narrative? The Jews are always attacked by some evil empire, by some evil force, and the Jews are always the minority yet they prevail. Now we can't say God was on our side here because Israel is a secular state, but there's that sense that, you know, we were right and we hold the moral high ground and therefore we prevailed. And um, the story is that Israel was under an existential threat in the months and weeks leading up to, uh, this became clear in the months and weeks leading up to, um, to June 1967. And uh, the Israeli army attacked and had to attack preemptive strike and prevailed, you know, again, thanks to our wit and our preparedness and, you know, against all odds. But one of the things that I did in preparation for the book, you know, being the general's son, I wanted to go and see what the general had to say in real time. My father was on the general staff of the IDF, of the Israeli army, in those, in, during those days. And there are a lot of books that actually have been written about that period. It's that period leading up to the war, the, the May, you know, <coughs> mid-April, May of 1967 and the beginning of June, and that what happened. And how was it that the war took place? Um, but still I thought I want to go into the Israeli archives, into the army archives, and take a look at actually what, what, the, what, 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 was, what was said in these meetings, in the IDF general staff meetings. Um, and there was one particular meeting that was interesting. It was on June the 2nd. It was when the cabinet the entire the Israeli cabinet came into the army headquarters for a discussion, which is interesting. Why would the cabinet go to the army and not the other way around? We're talking about a, a, a civilian democracy. It tells you something about the, about the balance of power in Israel. Um, and during that meeting and meetings before that, there's one line that I saw repeated itself, repeating itself, but I never saw in any other book. I never heard in any of, any of the documentaries that I've seen, and I've seen a lot. And that is that the Egyptian army, which was the threat, supposedly, uh, was not prepared for war. And if you recall, you know, the Egyptian army had moved into the Sinai Peninsula, which was supposed to be demilitarized. And Nasser, you know, President Nasser of Egypt, kicked out the UN peacekeeping forces and threatened to close the Straits of Tehran to Israeli shipping boats. Um, Israeli boats would not be able to go up to Elat. Um, and the army saw this as an opportunity for war. And w in, those, in those discussions, what was being said was the uh, Egyptian army needs another year and a half to two years in order to be prepared for war, therefore let's attack. We have an opportunity and we have a good cause to begin a war and destroy the Egyptian army. And the Israeli cabinet uh, was hesitant. 
they weren't so keen on war. And there was an interesting, there's an inter interesting uh, relationship between these two groups. The Israeli cabinet are made of older Jews, mostly immigrants from Eastern Europe, kind of my grandfather's generation. The Israeli, uh, the IDF general staff, they were all in their early 40s. Most of them were born in, but they were born in the country, they were born in Palestine, Israel. They were all in the Haganah, and these were these tough, you know, assertive, and they knew that they were ready. And when they saw that they were going to have to wait because the cabinet was hesitating, they said, well, the line is going to be that the threat remains, but of course the government has to decide what it has to decide. But they're really, really pushing for war, and again, and again, and again, and again, they were saying, the Egyptian army is not prepared for war. They're advancing an army that is not prepared for war. And they just saw this as an opportunity. Finally, there was a, there was a lot of pressure uh, that was placed on the cabinet, both by the army and by the, and uh, you know, there was popular pressure as well. And, um, and the cabinet decided to, to, to approve a preemptive strike against Egypt, which again is an interesting thing. People don't like to talk about this. The Israeli uh, cabinet uh, approved a, a preemptive strike against Egypt. The Egyptian army was destroyed, and the Sinai Peninsula was taken in a matter of a couple of days. And then the generals who were not part of that, of that battle, because they were in charge of the north or they were in charge of the central command, they wanted their piece of the war too. And they initiated the conquest of the West Bank and the conquest of the Golan Heights. Not with approval from the cabinet, but at their own initiative. The cabinet approval came afterwards, since it was a success, of course, everybody said, oh yes, of course, it was a wonderful idea. But it was not legal. And that's another point that was being made. Uh, that, we, that I talk about. And um, so then the Golan Heights was taken. And this is an area that Israel actually really wanted for a long time. And of course, the West Bank. You know, Israeli, especially the Israeli military, felt that the fact that the West Bank was not taken in 1948 was a big mistake. And finally, they were there. And they had Hebron. And they had Shiloh. And they had Shechem. They had all these wonderful biblical names back again in Israeli control. And of course, the old city of Jerusalem back in Israeli control. And these young generals, for the first time in over 2,000 years, handed the Jewish people control of the land of Israel. I mean, how much greater can you be? Gods of the Olympus. And this is how they were viewed by the people. This is how they were viewed by the cabinet. This is, I think, how they viewed themselves, too. Gods of the Olympus. Now, they knew that this was going to not, this was not going to be a difficult battle. But still, they delivered. And what's interesting thing, the interesting thing is that the entire thing took six days. If Israel was really being attacked by massive armies, could they do all this in six days? And in the process, kill over 15,000 Arab soldiers. As opposed to 700 Israeli casualties. 15,000 in six days, as opposed to 700 Israeli casualties. So again, when you look at the numbers and you look at the facts and you look at what actually took place, it's an entirely different story. So it's much easier to go back, fall back on the myth and say, well, this has happened again. It happened in 48, we were attacked and we prevailed. It happened in 67, we attacked and we prevailed. The Maccabees, we were attacked and we prevailed. David and Goliath, we were attacked and we prevailed. This is all the same thing. But again, when you look at... We have not talked about Syria much lately. The early brave demonstrations against the Assad regime were drowned with blood. The situation now is a sad mix of civil war and foreign intervention from Qatar and Saudi Arabia and the international community, meaning U.S. government-led imperialism. The U.S. Se the US seems perfectly fine with letting al-Qaeda and other backward forces into Syria to do its dirty work. On the other side, Assad gets support from the Russian and Iranian governments. Pity the poor Syrians. Finally, set aside Saturday, September 15th for our event in New Haven commemorating the Sabra Shatila massacre and the founding of the Middle East Crisis Committee. Featured speakers are Lamis Deek and poet Remy Kanazi. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller and this is The Struggle.